character, Father, so that when people look at us, they might see the family likeness with our Heavenly Father. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Uh, police work is hard. There's lots of reasons for that. Here's one. Uh, people assume police officers know everything. Officer, officer, my dog is having a heart attack. <laughs> There's no training package for that at the police college. It'd be nice if they brought out like a cavoodle puppet with chest pains uh, for me to practice on, but they never did. Uh, policing is boring. Uh, officer, officer, I'm having a baby. Like, ugh. No sweat. You just sit there and have the baby and I'll constantly ask if we'll be here much longer. Uh, policing uh, is exhausting. It's 3am and I'm tired and I must look miserable and someone on meth runs up to me and asks me if I regret my life choices. Uh, policing is complicated, true story. I once forgot about Police Remembrance Day. Uh, fair dinkum. Uh, one of the, you know what the, um, one of the hardest things was, though, about being a police officer? Forget about being spat on and death threats and clip-on ties. Uh, the worst thing, I kid you not, uh, was the quotas. Every day... Every week, every month, everything is about stats. How many RBTs did you do? How many arrests have you made? How many intel reports have you submitted? And so, you're on patrol, and across the radio comes a domestic. And I'm thinking, this job will tie me up for hours. And that's bad for my stats. You know, in my experience, uh, policing is me on my own ticking a bunch of boxes so I can keep my job. That's a terrible way to live. I bet you knew that already, didn't you? Our, our workplaces... Our marriages, our, our friendships, our parents, our teachers, our God. Oh, the pressure's on, right? It's up to 
your individual performance. You know, meet your key performance indicators. And if you don't measure up, man, there'll be consequences. If you don't get the house tidy and the dinner cooked, if you don't perform, your husband, he'll let you know about that, won't he? If you don't pour endless hours into your job, they'll find someone else who will, won't they? If, if you don't bedazzle the cool kids who you desperately want to, to be their friend, it, well, if you don't bedazzle them and impress them, you're not going to get invited around anymore, are you? If someone asks you, how are you going with God? How do you answer that question? Well, just like the rest of your life and me and the police, you'll give a bunch of individualistic moral statistics. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been trusting in Jesus. Like my policing career, your worth and acceptance is defined nervously and anxiously by what you do on your own. You see it all the time in, in your life and in mine. And yet it hurts us. But we can't help it, can we? We, we think and we act in all these situations like the solution must be me on my own and the choices I make and the things I do to make the grade. Uh, we have names for this. Uh, individualism, moralism, meritocracy. It's, it's the backbone of our culture and yet it does nothing but hurt us. But today, my family, hear this good news. You are not an individual who is saved by your performance. No, no, it's the opposite. You are saved by Christ for community. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people together at, uh, sorry, where am I? Together with Christ. I'm going to start that verse again, man. Let's, let's do that again, everybody. This is important we get this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi together together with overseers and deacons. We got it. We did it. Uh, this letter is about God's work to bring us into a partnership, count that word, with him and his people. Get ready to hear this anti-individual, anti-merit, anti quota message repeatedly in this series because every word of Paul's drips with what Christ has done to save us and to bring us together united in Christ and it's everything your anxious and lonely heart wants to hear and it flows from the beginning how does Paul start well he starts by saying man I'm one of you he says, I'm just Christ Jesus' servant, just like you. Uh, Paul, the apostle, writes to this church, and how does he introduce himself? A doulos in Greek, it, it's better rendered slave. Context certainly carries that sense. Paul, he's not saying, I'm better than you. Paul's saying, I'm one of you. We're all in this together. In fact, did you notice Paul puts himself on equal footing with Timothy. Man, Timothy is not an apostle. 
What are the Philippians, though? Individuals in Christ? No. They are a community. And you get that because they are always, I'll say that again, they are always referred to as a group. Verse 1, they are a holy people, a, a community. But in case we miss it, Paul says to all God's holy people. He just can't help it. He has to let them know it's everyone. But it doesn't end there. It's, it's weird in English, but it's, in Greek it's considered okay. Every single occasion you read the word you, it's always in Greek, you, plural. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember, use. Verse 6, he who began a good work in, use. Verse 7, it's right for me to feel this way about all of, use. Verse 8, I long for all of, use. Verse 9, it's use, love. Now, we hate this in the West. We have a long history of monasticism and, and pietism and scholasticism, you know, all other kind of bad individualisms. But, but being a holy one of Jesus, it's the opposite of individualism. It's being saved for a church community. Now, now why is that? You know, why are these people a community? It's because of Christ, verse 1. It's because of Christ, the church community of Philippi is holy. Christ gave his life to save peoples, to set them apart, to bring them into communion with God and with each other. And this is a huge deal for the Philippian church because we will see that there are a bunch of people saying that your individual piety your, your godliness quota, your, your KPIs, they're saying that saves you. It's, it's what you do on your own that makes you right with God. It's individualism and morality and merit which saves. And, and we think like that sometimes, don't we? Holiness, what's that? That's something special we do on our own have more faith give more pray more do some pious act of excellence but that's not what the bible says the bible says that's the opposite of holiness the bible says it's opposite to isolated actions that you do on your own holiness is what god did for you in christ to save you to make you clean, to make you right, to make you holy. That's why Paul is constantly saying, in Christ. In fact, Paul will use in Christ language 49 times in 104 verses, all to give you one point. The only thing that counts is not what you do on your own, but rather what Christ has done for use it's what christ has done for you so you get to go to heaven when you die no no it's 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 so much bigger than that in christ you are saved from merit you are saved from loneliness and, and isolation and you are brought into a relationship with none less than the god of the whole universe verse 2 and God's people. Is this very weird? Yes, it is. And don't forget the context. Paul, now who's he? He's a zealous Jew, presently imprisoned by Romans, and he's writing to a church which includes his former Roman jailer and Greek women. And probably a once demon-possessed slave girl who used to walk around annoying Paul. Read about it in Acts 16. What a bunch of misfits who should hate each other and especially Paul and definitely not meet together each Sunday and through the week. 
And yet Paul says, because of Jesus Christ, you are holy, you are God's, you are together, you're a partnership with me, we are a community, wow. And this isn't, you know, airy fairy, ivory tower platitudes. Man, man, this is theology and, and it shapes everything they do. It's the reason why the Philippian church not only sends Paul money, man, they, they send him a person, Epaphroditus, to, to encourage Paul. It's the reason why Paul wants to send Timothy to them. You can read about it in chapter 2. What Christ has done to save and to bring community shapes everything the Philippian church does each day, especially Sunday. My goodness me, we're still in verse 1. But in case we miss the point, how it's not about us and what we do as individuals, but rather what Christ has done for us as a church community, verse 2, it's grace. A charis in Greek, it means it's a gift. Unlike our, our silly individual meritocracies, grace is something that we did not earn. It's, it's generosity. It's a gift. And, and who is this generosity from? You know the answer. It's from this heavenly partnership. Same verse, God the Father who sent Jesus Christ our Lord. And and what is the outcome of this Christ one holiness and, and communion? And verse 5, they are a partnership. And that's a community word. A, a partnership in the gospel, same verse. Our, our partnership is for what Christ has done, in what Christ has done. And this sees them go out with the good news of Jesus. And Paul's so excited. He can't help but to repeat himself in verse 7 and 8. Read it later. They, these people have peace with God the Father because of the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore a community. You read those words in verse 7 and 8. Love and affection with Paul and each other and because of all that, a mission to share the good news of Jesus. But, but Paul wants to make sure that we know that it's not something we do. So verse 6, being confident of this. And you're thinking, why be confident, Paul? Well, look at the verse. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. My family, uncertainty is born out of the exact same issues we've been reading about. Yeah, individualism, moralism, meritocracy. But confidence and joy, there we go. Uh, where does that come from? Where is certainty? Where's hope? Verse 6, he, that, that's God the Father, he began a good work in you. The gospel is always, 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 only, only, only God's initiative in your heart. But don't end there. He who began the good work will carry it on to completion. My family, you did not choose God. And don't ever say that because it's individualism. It's meritocracy. It's, it's arrogant. And most importantly, it's untrue. Now, now where does confidence come from? It's, it's this. It's God chose yous. God began a good work in yous. Not only that, God will see yous through. From, from start to middle to finish, it's God and only him to save you, to make you holy, to give you faith, to accept that salvation, to share the good news of Jesus in gathered community. Man, praise God. Man, you can have confidence this day. You can rejoice this day. Why? Because of your decision? Because of your faith? Because of your continued following Jesus? No. And that's individualism. That's you putting your faith and hope and trust in you. No, 
Now you can rejoice. God your Father loves you. He intervened in your life. He began, he, he brought faith to you, he brought Jesus to you, he brought his gospel to you to save you. Will, will God let you go? Will God forget about you? Will God dump you? No, he won't. God doesn't let go of his communities. God doesn't let go of his families. And God doesn't let go of Harborside Presbyterian Church. God always finishes what he started. God always does what he says he will do. Man, praise him. And because of that, are you ready? Paul has a lot of joy. He has tons of joy. In fact, that word joy or rejoice, 15 times, well done everybody, 15 times in Philippians. You'll find that word in one in every three sentences. And, and think about it. Paul is in prison. He writes to a church which is a Roman colony. These guys, these guys aren't worried about the you know, church upsetting their kids' sleeping patterns or missing their favourite TV show or COVID-19. These guys turn up to church every week worried they're going to get locked up and executed. You know, Nero... Uh, he's a Roman dude. He's come to power. And Nero's hobbies include poetry and playing the fiddle and burning Christians alive. My goodness me, he'll be responsible for killing Peter and Paul. And Paul writes this letter from prison and probably the most dominant theme for this persecuted church is joy. Are you crazy, Paul? No, he's not. He just gets what it means to be liberated from individualistic moralism and quotas and religiosity. To be saved by Christ, but don't stop there. And drawn into a community to participate and partner in gospel mission, to, to make disciples, to share the good news of Jesus, knowing that God started it all and will never let you go. Man, what a rich blessing. What awesomeness. What privilege. Man, what joy. Man, we at Harborside, we are not individuals who gather once a week at best for an hour. That's not who we are. We are a community of people saved by Christ to know peace with God and to share our lives together. We, we partner together on mission sharing the good news of Jesus. And we grow in God's kingdom together as we grow followers of Jesus together. And why all that? Because of Jesus. He saved us for this very thing. My family, hear this good news. You don't have to do life on your own anymore. Men, come to church. Every Sunday, your growth group, your discipling relationships, hang out and then party and eat together through the week. Because Jesus saved you, liberated you, set you free for salvation with God and with others. A church and growth groups and discipleship, those aren't things you do. We don't do those things here. They're not hardships we endure. Man, those are signs of what God has done for you to bless you. Now, apparently, there's a, like a COVID pandemic, and I know that affects what we do as a church right now. And, and people get sick, and, and people go on holidays, and uh, that happens to me too, and that's okay. But saying you're a Christian and then rocking up to church once a month unless nothing better comes up. Man, that's like saying that I'm level seven vegan, but I regularly hunt, slaughter, and consume endangered animals like dugongs, elephants, and unicorns. Man, man, if you're a Christian, man, you are part of a church community. Man, that's not punishment. My, my goodness me, that's your hope. And my goodness me, I see it Sunday by Sunday. 
people overjoyed, lifting their hands in praise and song. I see it, people praying with each other, people discipling each other, people gathering around to read God's word, people eating and having fun together, people sharing the good news of Jesus together. People who know that they're accepted, not by what they've done, but what God started in them and that God will see them through together. And it's beautiful. My goodness me, man, don't miss out on that. Uh, Because I'm easily the best and most humble husband to ever exist... I purchase and wrap three presents for my wife, Beck each year. Birthday present, Mother's Day present, Christmas present. And so on one tri-yearly attempt to go through the completely unnecessary process of putting wrap around an object which Beck already purchased, uh, I was, it's unnecessary, I, I was looking for some scissors and I found some in Beck's quilting room. Brilliant, I'm thinking. Beck will feel super guilty for accidentally forgetting to nominate me as the husband of the year 18 consecutive times because I'm going to take her strangely polished scissors and I'm going to cut and wrap the stuffing out of this brilliant present that she identified, purchased and gave to me to give to her. But for reasons that are beyond me, Beck's craft scissors are fitted with a silent alarm (laughs) and motion sensor anti-theft technology. Because seconds later, Beck has dived through a closed plate glass window, shouting at me, drop the scissors! Now, for reasons that I still can't process, craft scissors are not meant for cutting paper. Man, that's a thing. Surely they're designed for cutting things, but apparently not. Seems illogical, but men, man, just trust me on this. This this is a thing, right? Now, here's the important bit. 50% of this room is wondering why Beck didn't impale my face with those scissors. And the answer to that question is, it'll blunten the blades. (laughs) But, But you might also be wondering... Uh, How on earth a thoughtless man like me is still married to a pretty woman like Beck? How could that be? Ah, it's easy. My marriage to Beck is not based on merit. Now, you knew that. But it's, it's not based on my performance. It's not something that I deserve. It's based on what Christ has done for me. Christ has shown Beck and I his love, has forgiven Beck and I and drawn us together in marriage. And we have our own little community. We don't have to do life on our own anymore. Man, that's not a curse. Man, that's a blessing. And so because of Christ and and his commitment to us together... We are committed to that community, marriage, in lots of different ways. And here's one way. Beck has chosen to love me in spite of my attempted crafts as a usage and possibly a litany of other sins as well. Now, you knew this already. My marriage is not based on what I do on my own. Now, it's the opposite. It's based on Christ and his love, then then that love and forgiveness flows into every interaction that Beck and I have together. And so, I live in a community, not based on merit, not based on anxiety or individualism or performance or record-keeping, but rather a marriage based on love, forgiveness and acceptance. It's pretty awesome. And my marriage, my family, is just a small picture, a very small, imperfect picture of something far greater. 
And that's the relationship between Christ and his church. Christ gave his life to save yous. Oh, sorry, let me start again. Christ gave his life to save you. Oh, you've missed the point. Christ gave his life for his community, the church, Ephesians 5. My family, hear this wonderful news for your lonely and overworked hearts. Like my marriage, you are not lone rangers egging out an anxious existence trying to impress God and others. You have been saved not by what you do, not by individual thoughts and actions, not by your choice, but by what Christ has done for you to bring your lonely, forlorn heart into his community. My goodness me, praise God. You know, I wonder what it would look like for you to know the work that God started in you, to save you, man, from yourself. To, to save you from individualism, to save you from moralism, to liberate you from anxiety and, and performance, to bring you into a loving, accepting community, to, to partner in gospel mission in that community. What, what would it look like for you to let go of individualism each Sunday? What would it look like for you to remember the price Jesus paid as you gather with your growth group? What would it look like for you to regularly share the good news of Jesus in this community? My family, don't miss out on the joy Jesus brings you here on Sunday and every other day of the week. It's literally a taste of heaven. Pray with me. Our Lord, uh, we confess this day that we've become absorbed with Western individualism. Our Lord, so often we put our centre at the selves of not only salvation, but every other component of our lives. Our Lord, we think it's all about us. And Lord, we confess this day that that's a lonely uh, thing that we do. It's an anxious thing we do. It's a sad thing we do. And Lord, it's hurt us. Lord, please forgive us. Lord, thank you that salvation is about you and only you in every way. Lord, we thank you this day that you save us in Christ and that you draw us together, not only in a community with you, with our Heavenly Father, with, with your Holy Spirit, but with each other. Lord, we, we don't have to be lonely anymore. Lord, we pray now that by your spirit you might be working in our hearts to show us what that looks like in our lives, especially here on Sunday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ben, uh, for bringing that, uh, that message to us. Um, this last song that we're going to sing is uh, the theme song for this a series in Philippians. We are one in the Father's love. We have every tribe and every tongue. We're found in the risen Son. We are bound together by his blood. Let us walk in love, uh, for we are one. And this morning, uh, we decided unanimously as a music team that that Sunday that we come back together and we're allowed to sing together, we want to sing this song with you guys and declare that we are indeed one in Christ Jesus. Amen. i 
What a fantastic song uh, to finish our time with together this morning as we begin our look at the book of Philippians. As we've been thinking about this morning, we are not individuals saved by our performance. We are community saved by Jesus. We have a partnership in Christ and for Christ. We have that promise that he will finish the work that he has begun in us. We rejoice because of Jesus. We grow as followers of Jesus together. Let me conclude with the words we began with from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, says this. Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Hope you can stick around for some morning tea uh, in the foyer. Uh, God bless and have a great week.